Hello and welcome to episode number 395. This is the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com and I'm Cornelius Fichtner. This is another episode where I'm asking, are you currently studying or thinking about studying for your PMI ACP exam? Wonderful, because that's what we are going to be talking about. This is the third and final interview in which we learned from one of my work colleagues how they passed their PMI ACP exam. And of course, that brings me to this. If you are a project manager who wants to become PMI ACP certified, then the easiest way to do so is with our sister podcast, the Agile Prepcast, and get your certification training for the exam by watching the in-depth exam prep video training from agileprepcast.com. In this interview, we are going to meet Yasmin Darcy. Yasmin is not only one of my students and co-workers, she is also the project manager in charge of developing the sample exam questions that we use in our PMI-ACP exam simulator. And so, if you not only want to know how to prepare for your PMI-ACP exam, but also want to hear about all the work that goes into actually creating one of the training tools that you could be using, then you have come to the right place. As you know, the rules of all PMI exams are such that we are not allowed to discuss specific questions from the exam, but we can discuss Yasmin's overall experience, general thoughts on the process, and her recommendations to you. So you can look forward to an experience and tip-filled interview on how to prepare for and pass your PMI ACP exam. And now, does a podcast interview qualify as an information radiator? Enjoy the interview. The Project Management Podcasts feature interview. Today with Yasmin Darcy, Senior Project Manager for OSP International. Hello, Yasmin, and thank you very much for stopping by. Hello, Cornelius. Thanks for having me over. Sure. Well, first of all, congratulations on passing the PMI ACP exam. Thank you. I'm glad that's over. (laughs) (laughs) When exactly did you pass? I passed in November. I recall it was a holiday weekend. So I studied and prepared on Friday, and I went in and took my exam bright and early on a Monday. Okay. And uh, the PMI ACP is not your first exam, right? You've already taken the PMP before that. That's right. I took my PMP a few years back. Right. And then you also have an MBA on top of that. That is true. Okay. (laughs) And (laughs) what we also have to do at this point is we have to insert a disclaimer because you and I are colleagues. We both work for OSP International. We are a training company. And we do offer PMP exam training and PMI ACP training. And uh, I believe you used both our Agile prep cost and our exam simulator, right? That, that is true. That is true. And you were also in charge of making sure that our Agile uh, sample questions in the simulator get updated to the latest exam specifications. We'll get to that later on, but just to get this disclaimer out at the very beginning. So my first question is always very similar. Now that you have passed the exam, what is your number one recommendation to the listeners who are currently preparing for the exam? Um, I think my number one um, recommendation is for people to understand what their goal is when taking this exam. For myself, I wanted not only to pass, but also to have good understanding of all the material. So in retrospect, unlike many other students who may not have read through most of the books, I opted to try to at least read through, not thoroughly, skim through in some cases, but in for purposes of uh, the work that we do. And in order to prepare for the exam, I thought it important to go through and spend the time and read those 12 references. Probably not what everybody wants to do, but in my case, I, I did. <laughs> okay, and and let me just jump into this one here, because currently the PMI-ACP exam 
has a recommended reading list of about 12 books or so. We can see in the horizon, uh, at the horizon, that this is going to change, that PMI is working on the Agile Practitioner's Guide, and very likely some point, at some point in the future, the Agile Practitioner's Guide is going to be the, the thing to read as you are preparing for this exam. So, so let me ask you this. Even though the exam is currently based, and the one you took, based on those 12 books, you read those 12 books, is the way you studied still going to be applicable in, say, five years, 10 years down the road when someone's listening to this interview? I think with the advent of the Agbok, that's probably less likely to be the case. I think that the 12 references will always be useful, but it is very special knowledge, very deep knowledge that is useful for a practitioner to have and own these references. And that's what they are. They're references. If you needed to learn more deeply about a particular topic, it's nice to have it on hand. You can read about the specifics of Scrum or Kanban, um, but likely for preparation for the exam, the Agbok 10 years from now will be very well used and developed. So that will right. change how people will prepare for the exam. Right. So how, uh, just like people study the PMBOK guide today for, as they are preparing for the PMP exam, in the future, they may be studying the, uh, well, we call it sort of Agbok jokingly, the agile body of knowledge. It's it's probably I think the working title is the Agile Practitioner's Guide. So whatever it will be called, you know, in the future, more focus on this. But the other study materials that you used, I believe you read. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You did read a exam prep book. You did go through our Agile prep cost, and you did use the questions in our exam simulator, right? That would still be something that you'd recommend. Yes, definitely. I had. Uh probably watched through the Agile prep cast over the twice <laughs> over the course of two years and more thoroughly in preparation for the exam. And in particular, I found the lessons on the Agile manifesto and the values and principles and different methodologies quite useful. Uh, but I also used another exam prep book, again, to get uh, good understanding of all the seven domains at a high level and where I was like, oh, I don't understand more of this, that I had the 12 references that I could refer to. And all that was very useful in preparing for the exam. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that you said that because when uh, I did the interview with uh, Stas Padoxin, and uh, people will already have listened to this one, um, Stas said that because he he took a course at the University of British Columbia, that course really uh, overlapped about 80%. And so he did not find the Agile prep cost all too helpful in addition to this. But you're saying that there was a value in you watching and listening to the Agile prep cost. Is that right? Yes. And I found that, again, when... You can listen to it. That's one mode. And I think that's what I did maybe a, a couple of years prior to actually taking the exam. Then it's useful because there's so many topics. You can use it and you don't have to navigate from the very beginning all the way to the very end. But you can select based on your own knowledge. I already know about this topic. I think there's no need to listen to this for myself. I think that I'm adequately prepared Oh, but no, when I wanted to refresh, a uh, total refresh on scrum ceremonies and make sure that I understand the specifics in great detail, that I didn't forget something or I misunderstood something, then I could sit down and set aside the half hour, whatever I needed to complete that lesson and listen to that lesson more attentively. So that's how I used it. I didn't probably use it in a, you know, st start start here and listen to every lesson a little bit a day. I didn't use it in that straightforward fashion. I tried to use it as I needed it in a very agile fashion, I would say. Right. Yeah. The The, the intent is actually to do, uh, you know, start here and go all the way through. Uh, the more important lessons are at the beginning, the somewhat less important ones are at the end. But you are uh, an unusual student from from that perspective, because you know, we work together. You've had access to this for years, and so. But let's let's talk about the exam prep book that you used. What 
book did you use and what did you enjoy most about it? Yeah, I used Mike Griffith's book. What a surprise. <laughs> it, it, it seems like that's the answer I get from everybody these yes, days. Yes, <laughs> I think, again, because he, it's organized by the domains and, there, for example, in the first few pages, they have a table and it, it's divided by tools and techniques and knowledge and skills. So at a high level, he has lists of different topics. So it helps guide you through um, the different topics and... It ensures in a relatively small amount of number of pages compared to the 12 references that at least you have covered the breadth that you need to cover for purposes of preparing for one's exam. And it's easy reading. It's not you know, very difficult on the lighter side compared to other references. Mm -hmm. Now, you've had the MBA Then you took the PMP and then you decided to go for the PMI ACP. Why did you select the PMI ACP over, I don't know, maybe a, a CSM or other agile certifications? That's a, that's, that's a good question. In part, it is related to the work that we do. And definitely taking the exam helps in preparing others uh, to prepare for the exam. But in general, I just think that the way that we work has evolved quite a bit, especially since the time that I took my MBA. I have been on many traditional projects in the past, and the idea that things change and to embrace that, what a concept. In past, you try to fix everything so that you can predict it, and you probably spend so much effort trying to make sure that you've planned everything up front But you end up having to change things in between. So I think that the need for an agile approach, th this is how the world operates now. Things move very quickly. Um, mm. I didn't explore the CSM. Uh, oh, I do have a CSM. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so many letters I, after your yeah, name, you keep no, forgetting. Sorry. I mean, you sort of, we use it almost every day you almost forget that you have it and it's not like you go around and sign your name and put all the letters behind it i think you gain knowledge as you go and it just come becomes sort of part of your um repertoire so to speak and yes i i do have my scrum certification and we do use scrum on our own projects so yes yeah and this is maybe an interesting history here uh, for the listeners When we originally developed our PMP exam prep course, that was done fully in a traditional waterfall-based project management approach. Then we started uh, with the Agile prep cast, helping people prepare for the ACP and also the simulator. And again, that was done based on traditional best practices. We were only starting out on Agile back then. Later on, when PMI changed the uh, ACP exam, we had already started out on the Agile path and we did the updates using Agile practices. And right now, pretty much as we are recording this interview, we are in the process of updating our PMP training, the waterfall-based certification, and we're actually using Agile practices to update a training course that is focused on traditional waterfall base so things are certainly evolving and changing over the years it's, it's a bit ironic i guess if you think yeah. of it that way <laughs> but it is true. yeah as even as we approach something the, the material and the content itself might be based on something very traditional um the way in which we operate is agile because um, things change within our team maybe the methodology itself is more stable and certainly from Pimbach 5 to 6 there are changes and it's similar ideas it's ever evolving uh, but in our team definitely things happen and we need to be able to adjust ourselves to the changes hmm. all right back to you and your PMI ACP experience you mentioned that you had a lot of experience on traditional waterfall based projects how then did you determine that you were in fact eligible to take the PMI ACP exam with all the agile experience you needed? Well, first step definitely is you need to re go to the PMI website and understand all the requirements to make sure that you have the 
training experience as well as the work experience required. And I think I mentioned that a couple of years ago, I started watching the Agile Prep Cast, and I was actually eligible back then, but never really got around to applying and taking the te- exam. So it is it does take effort and focus to complete all the steps. Um, but that's what I did. I just went through, it's like a checklist, make sure that you have all your ducks in a row and send in your application. Did you read just what's on the website or did you download the PMI ACP handbook and the PMI ACP exam content outline, two separate documents here, and did you read through them to understand what's required? Again, my case is a little different as we were very much involved in trying to prepare our own questions for the simulator. So I was very familiar with the exam content outline and what to expect in terms of the content of the exam itself. I think I went to the PMI website more to understand the mechanics of the application process itself, how how to book the exam, what was the timing, would I get audited, you know, questions like that that is sort of separate from the content of the exam itself. Mm. Well, let's answer that question right away. Did you get audited? Fortunately not. Ah, I, I so have, Jonathan I, was the only one, uh, <laughs> lucky one on our team who got audited there. Yeah. Um, let's take a look at your experience hours that you had on Agile projects. Was your designation project manager? Yes, I, I put in hours that uh, uh, based on the criteria in the mm-hmm. application. And I made sure that my training hours and my experience hours in line with what was required. And I made sure that you and me, because many of my hours, I've been working for uh, together with you for a while in, in this agile style and to make sure you were happy with how I described the work that I did. Again, all in preparation for the off chance that an audit might occur, that everything was on the up and up and that there'd be no surprises. Yeah, that relates back to the requirement that on the exam application, you, uh, the student, has to fill in a contact name. So he said, you know, I worked at this company on this project. I earned 500 hours. And the contact person here is Cornelius Fischner, uh, in, in your particular case. And what you did is to make absolutely certain that that was correct. You sent all this information to me before you submitted your application so that I could look at it and say, yeah, that that looks right. I, I, you know, in case of an audit, I would I would approve this, and I would reply back to PMI and say, yes, this is correct. This is indeed what you had. And there's one more thing I, I'd like to point out uh, because this is a PMI ACP lessons learned. You don't actually have to be project manager on the projects that give you your agile experience because this is the PMI. Agile Certified Practitioner and not professional, practitioner. That's that's the important bit here. So you can be a designer on Agile projects. You can be a sponsor on Agile projects. You can be a developer, a, a content developer or subject matter expert. So your participation on an Agile team is what counts here and not the fact that you are a project manager. How difficult, Yasmin, was it for you to fill in the application? I think it was straightforward enough. Definitely in the application itself, you'll find that they have a limited number of words you can use to describe something. So you do have to be short and succinct and appropriately picky with the words that you include to make sure it adequately and best describes your experience. Otherwise, it is a matter of sitting down and working through it. I did do it a couple of times. I think I had a first run, then I uh, had a review process (laughs) and made further edits before the final version. So I did give it some thought. Yeah, lucky you. You had a couple of colleagues who had just submitted their applications as well. So (laughs) you could ask them, what exactly should I write and how should I write it? One thing we we want to make absolutely clear here is, though, even though there was an editing process going on, 
you always stuck 150% to the truth, right? There was no fudging or, or misinterpretation. Definitely not. And I think I was first to apply and the colleagues uh, oh, were able to <laughs> take advantage of, <laughs> uh, of my experience. But it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah. So how long did you actually study then? You mentioned, you know, I, I'm a different kind of a student because for so long you have had been, you know, involved in this and looked at our training materials and helped develop the training materials. How how much time did you then actually spend sitting down and really studying for this? That's a good question. Again, I'm not the norm because I think I had some knowledge prior and I wasn't starting from a blank slate. But I would say a couple of months. I think the first month was, okay, I will read through uh, the exam prep guide from beginning to end, but at the leisurely pace. And I know the week beforehand, I was more serious, setting aside hours after work each day to really read through each chapter again. And that final day, you know, that was a holiday weekend, that entire Friday, I know I spent studying and reading through uh, the reference material again. So yes, two months, I would say but with various levels of dedication. Any memorization during that time? I, I didn't memorize, nor okay. do I recommend, I think, for people to memorize. I think it's key to understand the concepts of what they're learning, especially, I think, pay attention to the principles and values and the idea behind what the PMI-ACP approach is about and what Agile is about. At the time when you took your PMI ACP exam, our ACP simulator wasn't quite ready yet. Did you use a competitor's simulator by any chance? I actually, I actually didn't. You didn't, okay. Nor, nor, nor did I use a simulator formally for my PMP exam prep. I think I go through questions, but offline or uh, through free questions and particularly for the PMI ACP exams, we were composing questions and writing questions and reviewing questions. So I didn't really go through a formal simulator. I used our own, but mm -hmm. I, do, I wouldn't really count that because I was familiar with a lot of the questions. Right, so. because you wrote them yourself. And uh, this is probably the moment when we have to take a hard stop and say, but explain, so wait a minute. You were not yet PMI ACP certified, yet you developed questions for the exam. And of course, there was always a PMI ACP certified person in the back who would review these questions and ensure that they are appropriate and that they are factually correct and that they match what has to be expected on the exam. Let's talk about this a little bit here. Uh, how long does it take to write a good PMI ACP exam sample question? I think it's just like any good project manager or ACP practitioner <laughs> who's asked for an estimate. You have to give a range. Definitely there's a minimum that you couldn't physically type up a question but And it would depend on the experience of the person writing the question. A good PMI-ACP practitioner might not make for a good PMI-ACP exam question writer. So it does take familiarity with what is required. And if I had to, and I think if somebody really good had to, they could write a question in 15 to 20 to 30 minutes full out. But that's just writing the question first draft. And because we do take the time to review and vet the question further, and that might take more than one thing, probably a second round of review or even a third round of review to make sure that everything's factually correct. We try to make sure that we have a reference to back up the information that we provide, that it's consistent with so many variables that could be included in a question, that it's in line with a value or a principle or a concept. And that's through four different choices and to ensure that one choice stands out as the best answer 
and therefore the correct answer and to explain that in a way that is very clear does take time. So I don't know if that quite answers it, your it question. It does, it does. But, yeah, but I think basically more than you would yeah. think. So let's let's calculate <laughs> this out. So we have we have four exams, right, in our simulator. And each correct. exam has 120 questions, is that correct? That's yeah, right. so four times 120 questions. So we're talking 480 questions, right? And let's take a, an, an easy average, uh, 30 minutes. So uh, times 30 minutes, that, that makes 240 hours of question development. And that's just if we take the minimum time required, right? That, that, there's, that there is now no review done, no no secondary review, no ensuring that everything is correct. So at least 240 hours to develop just to spew them out and get them ready uh, without any that's quality right. control. That's right. Yeah. I think there's, it's, a, it's a writing process. It's a creative process. It's a review process to ensure that what the writer has in mind, the audience understands yeah. that it's not, it's that it's the, for example, the right level of difficulty, not too easy. Otherwise people won't learn what they need to yeah. learn, but not too difficult. Otherwise that is frustrating. And we want it to be in line with what the real exam is like. Mm -hmm. So all those parameters make it much more difficult than what you might imagine at first blush. Mm -hmm. So, dear listener, if you see a PMI ACP question out there, remember that someone spent at least half an hour <laughs> developing that question for you. Um, let's talk a little bit about ethics here, uh, because you, uh, you developed questions before you went to the exam, and then you saw what questions are actually on the exam, so you saw the real stuff. But you're not allowed to talk to anybody when, you know, after the exam about this. So how, how did you work on this? You know, because today you're still working on these questions. How do you make sure that you stay ethically correct and you don't take what you've seen on the exam and implement this in our simulator? For one, I don't, I'm pretty sure my memory is not that good. <laughs> so since November, it's gone. What right. I know is what I know. Uh, so, so barring that, I think what we do try to incorporate is the style and the idea uh, and the approach of how the question is composed. So right. certainly there were some things that we we do and continue to do to improve the questions to be more in line with what we saw or what others have said they saw. And when we get feedback from students or when we ourselves give feedback about our exam experience, we don't go to a person and say, we got a question and verbatim state what the question and the choices were. No, I think we, we remember that there was a question on this topic. The it was difficult because two choices were very similar, or there was a term I didn't understand, or we see questions that are difficult because there were three different things compounded together in one choice, and I had to choose which one was not correct about it, which word made it incorrect, and therefore eliminated it as the best answer. So it's really the learnings, the style, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that really, it, we, we don't copy questions, definitely. We copy the it's the style. And it's not copy, it's following the style right. of the exam. Right. Yeah, I mean, information radiator, I believe we mentioned that earlier on. You know, you can be almost certain that one question from the 120 is going to be about an information radiator. But in what exact setting this is going to be and whether it's an easy, a medium or a hard question, what the style of the question is, that's really where we're trying to separate ourselves apart. We are trying to cover all the topics that you'll see on the exam. Um, we are going to use a very similar style, but we make absolutely certain that none of the questions that you see on our exam are actually taken from the real exam, because that would be a big ethical no-no right there. Was there anything on the real exam that surprised you? Overall, I don't think there was any big surprises. I do know one question struck me as 
I understood all the individual words, but when they spliced it all together, I couldn't quite understand what <laughs> they meant. Okay. So I could only guess that maybe this was an experimental question. But other than that, I think it 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 was what I expected in terms of how long it took me to take the exam, in terms of the content, in terms of what there's four choices. I mean, there in, in that sense, there were no surprise. There were no heavy calculations. I never used the calculator during the exam. So all, all those things I had heard, and it's very useful to listen to interviews like this or read through the forums of recent exam takers to refresh that in your mind before you step in the exam so that you don't feel surprised or taken aback such that it might impede on how you answer your, the questions and perform during the exam. How did you travel to the exam site? Did you drive with your car? Did you take public transportation? I drove with my car. And did you know where it was? I had an idea. I definitely mapped it out to make sure I knew the traffic patterns to make sure that I could get there. I, I prefer to be there early. Yeah. And not rushed, and not feel rushed or stressed. Uh -huh. So you did day. not visit the testing center uh, like a week before. I definitely didn't, and uh -huh. I believe it might have been even the same center that I had used. What's well, just my going to ask exam. that? The, but, you know, but, that was, but that was many years ago. It's not long. It was so long ago that I didn't exactly recall. I think what I did is after I scheduled the exam. I made sure I had a good idea where it was. It was mm -hmm. very it was near near the airport, so I knew I knew the general area okay. and had a good idea of how long it would take to get there. So I think just the comfort level, but but you're right. I think if you don't feel comfortable and you need to make an arrangement as to how to get there, you should do that so you have one less thing to worry about. In my case, I just made sure I had ample time to mm. get there. How early were you? How early was I? Probably half an hour. I didn't want to stay there too long. Right. Did they let you in ahead of time or did you? Did they make you wait until your actual time came up? In in my particular case, the center would have been closed. <laughs> okay. Right. So, I mean, I think the the center opens at a certain time. I my my goal was to get there right around the time the center opened. So okay. I probably sat in my car for five minutes. Then they started letting people into the lobby. Mm -hmm. And when it was closer to time, then that's when they let people into the exam. Okay. But that allows you time to, you know, go to the restroom if you need to. Familiarize yourself again with, oh, that, that's where the exam room is. And I know that there's some um, permetic centers that allow you to have a pre-appointment. Is it a test drive? Yes. Just just to allow yourself to get familiar with the, the place. I just didn't have enough time. I really booked my exam in a last possible responsible moment timing. Uh, I booked it probably a, a week, I think, before my actual exam. So I didn't have that luxury of being able to test drive. That means you must live in an area where there are either multiple testing centers or the testing centers are not always fully booked because sometimes I hear from students that they say, I had to book my exam months in advance because it was just packed. Yes, I think that must be the case. And for sure, some of the other students who were there were not taking a PMI-related yeah. exam. They, didn't, they looked more medical, I'm guessing, or uh, a, a lot younger, <laughs> I yeah. would say, than most. And and in my case, that was part of the impetus for taking the exam when I did. I, I was about booking it to sort of commit the date and asking myself if I was prepared enough, because again, I used that one week and tried to intensely prepare. And I said, okay, it's next week. Is that the week? But when I was looking at the testing appointments, I could see the appointments that I saw that were available yesterday weren't available today. And if I waited much longer, I wouldn't have been able to take the exam. I might have had to wait a month or relative to my own schedule. I'm sure there were spots available, but that might not have worked for my own schedule. So yes, I think it is more, it, it works to book ahead. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So during the exam, let's take a look a little bit at the interface uh, that we uh, that you experienced there. So same as on the PMP exam, there is a question, you have four answers, and you have to make the right choice, and then you hit next, right? That That's kind of how it works. Yes. In general, there's, a, there's an exam question, four choices. Choose to answer one or move move on to the next question. You could mark it to signify that it's something that you want to revisit later, and there's a mechanism for you to go back and review your marked questions. Mm-hmm. Or, or you can go forth and sort of review the questions that you had marked. Is there any kind of a penalty in regards to how the exam is scored when you mark a question? Well, if you mark a question and you don't actually provide an answer, it will be considered as wrong because it doesn't have the correct answer. Okay. So I if I select, the- yeah, but if I select A as the correct answer, but I'm not sure and I mark it, has that any effect on on how it's scored? No, I think that the scoring is purely based on your answer. Okay, it's either right or wrong. It's, a, it's either, yes, you it's have either, a point, or no, you don't get a point. It's either right. It's really a mechanism for students to be able to just as if you were writing your answers on paper. You might have put a little dot next to that question number. If you, I, I'm not quite sure about this. My advice is to try to give an answer anyway, and you can go back, review it, change the question, your your answer selection later when you do your review. Mm-hmm. But it's useful if you're not sure. I wouldn't use it too often, though, because you don't want to get through your 120 questions and have 100 questions marked. <laughs> and you definitely would have created more work for yourself um so use it sparingly but it is there so that you don't spend too much time on one question you have to have a reasonable pace and that's one thing that i did decide going in that how would i know to have checkpoints for myself 30 minutes an hour i should be done by with so many questions otherwise i know i have to pick the pace up and not not dwell on a particular question So I definitely had that mindset um, going in. And you had mentioned about the interface. And I think one thing aside from marking is that you do have the ability to highlight text if you want. And as you're eliminating choices, there is a strike out capability. So let's say you read choice A and you're very sure that it's not correct. You can use the interface to strike through that choice. So physically, there's a line across the text. So you know you shouldn't select that as the correct answer. And just to be absolutely clear, highlighting, marking, strike out, using any of these as you are reading through the question does not affect your scoring at all. That's right. Okay. The only thing that does affect your scoring is if you don't answer a question. So I'm done. I'm 120 questions. I've gone through. How do I know that I've actually answered all of them? Is is there some sort of a mechanism? I think that you it you will see which questions are unanswered. Is there so there's an overview, kind of? When when you I. I get confused now because I'm very used to our own simulator, but our own simulator is very similar, very similar to the real thing in that you have the question view where you view the question itself, but there's also a, an, we call it grid view, but there is an equivalent grid view on the real exam wherein you can see in tabular form the questions and whether you marked it and, and whether or not you provided an answer okay so there and then is, you there can is a way. quickly scan through and see oh question 84 i have not answered this one yet that's take right. me there let me answer it uh, yeah that's right or there's the good old-fashioned way which is i which i sometimes do is you have your piece of scratch paper and uh. feel free to write down and i think what i like about using traditional style is then i can write a little note to myself as to Remind, to remind myself later, why am I marking this or what? 
I, I, I tend not to leave questions unanswered. I'd rather make a selection. So I don't, I think that's just my style to just choose, choose the best based on what I know. Uh, but if I have any confusion, I'll write that question number down and you come write back later. some notes for myself. Yeah. Yes. How much did you actually write down during the exam other than, you know, okay, I marked question 84? Personally, for me, not much. And in past, and again, this is coming from the time that I took my PMP where you could do a brain dump. Uh -huh. Definitely, that was something that's not allowed now. Okay. There's no... You have to sit through that tutorial. You cannot use that time to <laughs> write out your brain dump. Right. And just to clarify at this point, a brain dump is still allowed. You may use a brain dump. You are allowed to take that piece of paper and write down your brain dump, but only after you click the start exam button. So writing down your brain dump is part of the three hours that you have available. And so you lose maybe five minutes of, uh, of time, and then you only have two hours and 55 minutes to go through all the questions that you have available there. Earlier on, you mentioned about having a plan. So before you went to the exam site, you knew exactly saying, okay, in the first 30 minutes, I have to answer that many questions. Then in the next 30 minutes, I have to answer that many. Was that as detailed as it was, or was it more sort of guidelines that you had set for yourself? I, I think I wanted to track, to have enough time to review my questions, at least half an hour, I would say. Mm -hmm. Half an hour to 45 minutes. And roughly, it's just easier to do the math if you have 120 questions and you want to add a buffer to that, to have an extra hour to review, then really you're talking about a question a minute. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it doesn't mean you spend exactly a minute per question. It just means on average, you would expect if you go at that pace that in 30 minutes, you should have covered roughly 30 questions, give or take. So if you're slower by a little bit, that's fine. There's no need to panic. But as you get to the hour, how far away are you? Are you get? It's like a burn down. Chart. I was just going to say you're talking about a burn down chart it's here. It's like a burn down <laughs> chart that you have to cover all 120 questions within the time limit, yeah. and yeah. allow yourselves yourself the luxury of um, depending on how many questions you mark. But I know other people who. What their answer is, is their answer, and they opt not to revisit and switch their answers around because they might be um, overcorrecting, yeah. <laughs> therefore so, answering things wrong. Now, here's my question for you. You really didn't use an exam simulator, so you never had a chance prior to the real exam to test your timing and make sure that, yeah, okay, I can do 30 questions in 30 minutes. Um, number one, was that a problem for you? You know, going in, did, did that add any sort of anxiousness because you never, you, you couldn't tell really? And number two, the obvious question, how close were you able to stick to your plan? While it's not true that I didn't formally use the simulator, right? given the fact that I've had to review a lot of questions, in doing the review of our questions, I definitely went through questions in my mind, maybe I didn't click the right answer or not the right answer while using our own simulator. I, I, I think I know myself and my pace. Okay. So that's sort of independent. Mm -hmm. But for sure, I, I was using this rough guideline of 30 minutes, one hour. What question am I on? And I think I was pacing okay. It wasn't exact, but okay. it wasn't far away enough that I said, oh, I'm in trouble. And when you're reading the questions, you know, some of the questions really, they're quite short. They're situational. It's really choi uh, question A, B, C, D, read it. It's not a long read. So a minute is usually quite comfortable. It's, it's those hard questions wherein you're debating with yourself what the right answer is. <laughs> you don't want to spiral down and take too long in those questions. And there mm -hmm. were a few that were like that. So it's okay. really about keeping your pace and making sure you don't get too distracted because you want to get 120 questions answered as best as you can 
then if you'd like to, you can revisit those that are taking a little more time and you can spend more time with it without feeling rushed. All right. One more question about the simulator and then uh, we're going to uh, close it with your uh, final recommendations and tips to our listeners here. So about the simulator. Um, nowadays, when people take the PMP exam, it, it's clear you you almost cannot pass the PMP exam without using a simulator because it's gotten so much harder and so much more complex and difficult. PMI ACP exam. What would you say? Is it a recommendation to use a simulator or is it already in that you really have to stage? I think I'd always recommend that you use a simulator, mm -hmm. especially the exam is not, um, it's not necessarily uh, what is A, what is B. It is very situational. So the more you're exposed to this style of questioning, mm -hmm. as well as having an opportunity to see topics in different forms from different angles really bolsters your understanding. So I would definitely recommend the simulator, both both for the PMP and for the PMI ACP. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, let's close it then. What are your final words, your final recommendations to our listeners who are currently preparing for the exam? Anything in addition that we have heard today? I would say it's important to understand the tenets of the agile approach and the values. I would pay attention and read that PMI ACP content outline and be very familiar with the tasks that are described in the content outline because I think much of the exam really is based and the situations that are included in the questions are based on those tasks and that outline. Uh, I think there is no need to read the books and reference material as I did, but definitely have an exam preparation plan. Uh, use the tools that you have, training materials such as the Agile PrepCast or an exam prep book and use tools like the simulator. They, they help quite a bit. Um, in terms of topics, again, I, I wanted to pay, and I think it was useful to pay attention to the different roles, ceremonies, the timing, the tools and techniques, and be very familiar with it to the point that you're not memorizing, but that it that you do truly understand what these concepts are so that when you're thrown a question, whether it's from this angle or that angle, it's not a problem. You, you know the material well. So just like anything, preparation, preparation. Wonderful. Yasmin, once again, congratulations on passing your PMI ACP exam. And of course, thank you so much again for stopping by today and uh, giving all your val valuable hints and tips and recommendations to our listeners. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelius. Thanks for having me over. And that was our PMI ACP exam lessons learned interview with Yasmin Darcy. Would you like to know more about the PMI ACP simulator that we talked about? Well, if you are preparing for your PMI ACP exam, then the best way to calm the butterflies in your stomach is to take a practice exam. Our PMI ACP exam simulator offers four such practice exams. To see how it works and take a free test drive, please go to pmexamsimulator.com and click on PMI ACP. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. As always, you can find us on the web at pm-podcast.com. Please send your emails to info at pm-podcast.com. And when you write, please tell me where in the world you are writing from. And finally, we have this for all those of you currently preparing for the exam. It does not matter how slowly you go, as long as you do not stop. Until next time.